Hello and welcome to this video on determining the range and rank of a linear, linear transformation. So in this video I'm going to be defining you know, the, what is the range of a linear transformation and also the rank of a linear transformation. Uh, and then we'll see examples of, you know, in which I'm given linear transformations, right? So I won't, I won't need to check if it's linear. It'll be told to me that it is a linear transformation, you know, so that that additivity and homogeneity property hold. And we'll be asked to determine the rank, uh, the range of the transformation, right? The set of all the outputs, right? That's the range, as you're probably familiar with, the, the range of a function. And also the rank of the transformation as well. All right. So first page, just some definitions. So the suppose I have a, a transformation T from vector space V to vector space W, and this is a linear transformation I am given. All right, so it satisfies, again, the additivity property and homogeneity properties. The range of T, sorry, the range of T, not range of Tis, right? this, is, this is this T here, sorry about that. The range of T is the set of all elements in the codomain. Right, W here is the codomain, and, and V is the uh, is the domain. Is the set of all elements, you know, vectors in W, maybe vectors called little w, such that an element in the domain exists that has W as its image. All right, an element V in the domain set V exists where T of V equals W. Uh, another way of another way of stating this is the range of T is all of the elements of the codomain that have a non-empty preimage. Right? All of the elements of the codomain that actually get mapped to by under this transformation, all the outputs, right? all the actual outputs. That's the range of a transformation. Uh, another way I could write this in, in set notation here is the range of T, right, the range of this transformation, is the set of all these vectors that look like this, you know, T of all the T of V in W, right, all the, all the vectors in the, the codomain that came from or that are the image of a vector in the domain, right, so all the T of V's such that V is from the domain. Now, the thing I'm going to point out here that's going to be important uh, is the range of T is actually going to be a subspace of the codomain W, right? So, I mean, it's obviously a subset of W, right? It contains vectors from W. It's non-empty. It, 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 uh, it would contain the zero vector, at least. Remember, the zero vector always maps to the zero vector of the codomain in a linear transformation. So this is non-empty. It would be closed under vector addition and closed under scalar multiplication. And I leave that to you to check on your own. But you can see that the range of a transformation, a linear, or a linear transformation will be a vector space, right? And, and also a subspace of the vector space W, the codomain. All right, so that's the range. And then the rank. Right, the rank of a linear transformation. The rank of a linear transformation is the dimension of the range of that transformation. Right, so this subspace of W here, this this vector space, the range of T. The dimension of that vector space is called the rank of the transformation. Uh, so if we're going to be finding a dimension, that means we need we're going to be finding a basis for the range of the transformation. Right and however many vectors are in that basis uh, will be our rank. Now you've heard the word rank before. Right? And, and again, if I'm, I'm assuming you're following videos of mine, 
and you've seen videos of mine before, on the rank of a matrix. Um, you know, we talked about the rank of a matrix in a prior video. Now, the rank of a matrix was the dimension of the column space of that matrix. Remember, the column space of a matrix is just the the, the vector space spanned by the columns, the column vectors of the matrix. Um, so, now what we're going to see here in these examples I have coming up, remember these are going to be linear transformations. And any linear transformation can be expressed as a matrix transformation, right? Where the, where the output is represented as a matrix multiplied by the by the input vector. That matrix is called the standard matrix and I'm assuming you know this as well, you've seen this before as well. So what we're going to notice, or what we're going to see, I'm going to point out in the examples I have, is that when you're talking about the range and the rank of a linear transformation, those will correspond to or be related to the column space and the rank of the standard matrix for that transformation. Okay. And uh, you know, hopefully rem re we remember, and I'll refresh your memory very briefly, on how to find a basis for the column space of a matrix. And that basis for the column space will correspond, you know, will help us find a basis for the range of a transformation. All right. So now these four, I got four examples I'm going to be going over in this video, and these are the same four examples I went over in my previous video when I was talking about finding the null space and nullity of a transformation. So you might want to look at those again. Now this, but I am asking for something different here, though, right? So I have the, I'm going to have the same four examples, the same four transformations. But now this time I'm asking, you know, determine the range and rank, not null space or kernel and uh, nullity, nullity. So determine the range and rank of the linear transformations. Again, these are all linear transformations. All right. Okay. So first thing, you could act, the, the range is actually pretty easy to state. It's finding a basis for the range, finding the, the dimension of the range that takes a little more work. Because um, I could very easily say, you know, I had this transformation here from R2 to R3, you know, between, between Euclidean spaces. It takes this vector from R2 with components x1 and x2 to this vector with three components here. And I could very easily state the range. I say the range of this transformation t is equal to, and I'll write it the way I had on the previous pages where I just list the outputs. You know, every vector in the range looks like this. x1 minus 2x2, 0, negative x1 for the components, where the vec you know, the, these, comp these x1s and x2s are coming from the domain. Right. Or you could just say that, you know, because these are coming from, this is coming from R2, you could just say that X1 and X2 belong to the set of real numbers. So, I mean, this is, this is perfectly valid. This is perfectly valid for the range of this transformation, the way I've described it. I just, every vector in the range looks like what the output looks like, and just, just so long as the input stuff is coming from the domain. All right. But the hard part, right, the more tricky part is, all right, now that I've written the range here, what's what's a basis for the range, right? We're we're trying to find find a basis so that way we can state the rank, right? The rank is just the dimension of the range. Well, let's look at this here. Now these are these are vectors in Euclidean space and you know, we've been working with Euclidean space vectors quite quite a lot. 
in these videos. I could also write this this way, couldn't I? Right, let, me, let me write this some other way. Where I take this vector here, and you see everything that depends on these two variables, x1 and x2, right, coming from my input. So I'm going to split this up into the sum of two vectors, one involving x1 terms and one involving x2 terms. And the ones involving x1 terms, I could pull the x1 out, right, and have x1 times and then this vector where the, the down the vector the coefficients of x1, you know, 1, 0, negative 1 here, plus, and then the vector involving x2, I pull x2 out of that, and down, and then, you know, it'll be some number x2 times the vector with the coefficients of x2 going down here, that'll be negative 2, 0, and then 0, Right. And so again, all I did was rewrite this as a sum of a couple vectors. Right. And you see what we have here. What this is saying, and again, x1 and x2 are just real numbers, right? Because that those are the components of a vector from R2, x1 and x, such that x1 and x2 are real. So here's another way to describe the range. Right? We can say the range of t is this thing. So what we're saying is that every vector, right, every vector in the output, every vector in the range can be written as a linear combination of the vectors 1, 0, negative 1 and negative 2, 0, 0. Now remember another way to say this was a span, right? Uh, this is the span of those two vectors, right? The set of all linear combinations of these two. So we could also say that the range of t is equal to the span of the set with these two vectors in it, 1, 0, negative 1, and uh, negative 2, 0, 0, right? Because every vector in, this, in the range can be written as a linear combination of these two vectors. That is what the span of a set is, the set of all linear combinations. All right, now maybe it's easier to find a basis for this, right? So again, you could have that, that, that. All of these describe the same set. All of these are the range of t here. And it looks to me like this set here, right? The set with the vector 1, 0, negative 1, and negative 2, 0, 0. That is probably a basis for the range of t. You know, because look, the, this set with 1, 0, negative 1, sorry. That is very faint. Uh, pitch that. All right, the set with 1, 0, negative 1, and the vector negative 2, 0, 0. Right, this set of vectors obviously spans the range, clearly. Right, because uh, every, you know every vector in the range can be written as a linear combination of these two. We saw that here, and you know there's only two of them, and they're not scalar multiples of each other. Right? You can't multiply this by a scalar to get that one. So that, remember, when you have a, a set with only two vectors and they're not scalar multiples, uh, the set is also linearly independent, right, and is uh, linearly independent. Right, so that means that this set is a basis for the range of t. Spans the set, spans the range, and is a set of linearly independent vectors. All right, so this tell so this leads me to the the rank. All right. So the rank of t. is 2. Sorry, push that up a bit. All right, because this, this basis for the range of t has two vectors in it. OK, wonderful. All right, so that's one way to go about it. Right, I just describe the range as I know, all just, just write the output again and just make sure that, you know, so as long as the, the inputs are coming from the domain, that is a perfectly valid description of the range, right? 
just all the all the output vectors such that the input is coming from the domain. But then we could think about how to rewrite that. Right? How, how do I express the output in other ways and uh, perhaps get it as a linear combination of some other vectors and is that set of vectors a basis? Right? You check to see if they span the set or and if they're linearly independent, all that stuff. Um, that would be you know the roundabout way, the, I'd say the long-winded way of, of checking for a basis for the range and, tr and trying to find the range and the rank. All right, so we see here the range is, you know, again that described that way, and the rank is two. All right, the dimension of the range is two. Now, another way to do this, since we have a since we have a linear transformation, right? and this is again, this is only for linear transformations. I should be able to express the output, represent it in some way as a matrix multiplied by the input vector. So how do I do that here? Right? So now this is a you know my my input vector is a two by one. This is a three by one. Right, so the, the, the matrix that I need to multiply by the input vector would be a 3 by 2. 3 by 2. You know, so that, and then times the input vector. And then down the first column, the coefficients of the first variable, x1, 1, 0, negative 1. Down the second column of this standard matrix, the coefficients of the second variable, negative 2. 0, 0. All right. So there's the standard matrix, right? This 3 by 2 matrix here. The standard matrix 4T, right, for this transformation. And I'm going to call this matrix A. And what I'm going to do now is find the column space of A. Right, because look, if you look at you know linear common, you see if you remember the column space of a matrix is the space, the vector space that's spanned by the columns of A. Well, look at the columns of A. They're one zero negative one negative two zero zero, exactly those vectors I had earlier that I said the range was made up of all the linear combinations of those. So this see see this is the column space of this standard matrix. Right? Every vector in the range is just a linear combination of the columns of the standard matrix, which I'm seeing earlier on, on my earlier pages. So the column space of A, right, the column space of A, remember this cola, right? this is the span of you know one zero negative one and the vector the other column vector negative two zero zero right and uh, they are independent right there there's only two of them there's not scalar mul there's no scale uh, there aren't scalar multiples of each other and we're done and these are vectors from R three right these are vectors from R three and notice the codomain is vectors from R3. So in that case, right, if if the codomain is Euclidean, and I'll write that point now. If the codomain is Euclidean, a Euclidean vector space, meaning you know one of those R ends, R2, R3, R4, then the column space of the standard matrix will be equal to the range of the transformation. Okay. Now we just have to remember. Now remember an alternate way to find the column space here. A basis for the column space was to take our standard matrix and put it into an echelon form. So whether it be echelon form or reduced echelon form. Uh, now this one. I did it in the last example, and again, you can put it in a calculator if you wished. But um, I would just, you know, to get there's a pivot one, and then to get zeros below, I'd get zeros below that, 
by adding the first row and third row, then you'd have a negative 2 down here. I'd move that 0 row to the bottom, and then change the negative 2 into a 1 and get zeros above it as well. So, like, again, you could perform more operations yourself by hand or use a calculator, put it in reduced echelon form. Totally fine. Now, remember, remember how when you put a matrix into reduced echelon form, Remember the pivot columns? Remember the pivot columns corresponded to the, the, the columns of matrix A that would form a basis for the column space. Right, the pivot columns correspond to columns of the original matrix that would form a basis for the column space. Okay, right. So the first column is a pivot column, right? Meaning that going back up to the original matrix, right, this vector is part of the basis for the column space. The second column is a pivot column, has one of these leading ones in it, so the second vector, the second column negative two, no, so one, zero, negative one, negative two, zero, zero, that set does form a basis for the column space of A. All right, so this is fine. I don't need to reduce this in anything anyway. This is also the range of T. All right, so the range of the transformation is all linear combinations of these two vectors, and then the set with these two vectors, as we're seeing here, the set with these two vectors form a basis for the range, a basis for the column space. So the rank, right, the rank of the matrix is always the same as the rank of the transformation, okay? The rank of the standard matrix is the same as the rank of the transformation, which is 2, okay? So we're seeing the range. And it's the same exact stuff I got earlier, right? I got the same span, the same rank earlier when I wrote it out like that. Right? Same span for the range, same rank when I found a basis. Right? It's just I find I find it's a lot easier, since you probably have had practice in this, taking a matrix and finding, you know, a basis for the column space and the rank of that matrix. Right? And then then you can state the then you can state the range and the rank of the transformation. Right. Great. All right. So ne next one. Yeah. Again, this is the same second example I had in my last video on null space and nullity. So here I have a transformation, a linear transformation. Right. It's got to be linear to be talking about this stuff from R3 to R2, where, again, my, my input vector maps to this output vector. Right, this three, three components to two components. All right, so I'm trying to find the range of T. Now, again, I could do this. Right, we could say that the range of T is, you know, the set of all vectors that look like this. Where the first component looks like this, x minus y minus 2z, the second component looks like this, has this form. Right, as long as this x, y, and z comes from the domain, right, as long as x, y, z are coming from R3, here, this, 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 where the x, so as long as x, y, and z are real. So this is a total, again, a totally valid way of writing the range. You could circle this and be like, "Hey, I'm good. That's the range." But you know, what's what's a basis for the range? So another way I could write this is again, you have these variables x, y, and z. So I could do what I did with the last example and split this vector up into the sum of, of several vectors, one involving x, one involving y, one involving z, and I have x times the vector with the coefficients of x down at 1, negative 1, plus y times the vector with the coefficients of y down at negative 1, 2, 
plus z times the vector with the coefficients of z, negative 2 and 3, as long as, again, x, as long as these x, y, and z's are coming from the reals, right? Because uh, that, that vector with x, y, and z, and it came from R3. So what we're seeing here is that the range of t is actually the span of the set of vectors with, you know, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, and negative 2, 3. Because right. every, vec every vector in the range is simply a linear combination of these three vectors. The question is, though, is this set of vectors a basis for this, for this range? So obviously the set with these three vectors, 1, negative 1, you know, negative 1, 2, and negative 2, 3, you know, they obviously span the range, right? That's fine. That's that's part of it. But they are dependent. It is a dependent set. And why is that? Right? Remember, when there are more vectors in the set, right? When there are more vectors in the set than there are components, it's a dependent set. And look at this. Couldn't I take negative 1 times this first vector, add it to the second vector, and get the third vector? We'll check it out. You know, take negative 1 times the first one. That would be negative 1 here, plus this one would be negative 1, would be negative 2. Multiplying the first one by negative 1 again would be 1 plus 2 is 3. Negative 1 times this first vector plus the second vector would give me the third vector. So the third vector depends on the first two. So really, I don't need it then, right? This this doesn't belong. I don't really necessarily need this because it is a linear combination of these first two. So same here. I don't need that third vector. And now I can say that the range of t is the span of just these two. And these two are independent, right? Right, if I got rid of that, get, got rid of that vector negative two three. Now these two are independent, right? There's only two of them, and they're not scalar multiples of one another. So there's a basis, right? This set with just these two vectors in it. So I could also say that the range of t was the span of these two vectors one negative one negative one two, and then therefore the rank of t is again 2, right? The, 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 the size of the basis, the, uh, this set here with just two vectors has a basis, right? Just the, okay, so here again the range is a span of a couple vectors, the, 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 the rank is again 2. Uh, but let's do this, you know, that other way where I take a look at the standard matrix, right, and put that in some echelon form and all this. All right. All right, so again, uh, this is a linear transformation, so I should be able to write this result, this output, as a matrix times the input vector. And it'll be a 2 by 3, coefficients of x, coefficients of y, coefficients of z. Alright, there's your 2 by 3, and then times the, vec the input vector x, y, z. Alright, so here's your standard matrix. And again, I'm going to call it A. And if I were to put this into, you know, reduced echelon form or echelon form, reduced row echelon form, uh, I'd get the following. You know, one zero, right? I'd just add, and then you know, there'd be a one here, and then I'd make zero above it. And if I were to add these, it'd be one there. And that would just add again. So negative one up top, negative one here, one there. All right. And again, you can use your calculator, which I know I have a calculator up, but this is only two rows, right? Not need no no real need to jump to the calculator to put it in some echelon form. So do you see how in echelon form here, reduced echelon form, you know, the first column has a, one of those leading ones in a row, the second column has a pivot. So, this first vector, this first column, 
and this second column right, that correspond to the two pivot columns in, in the matrix in echelon form, those first two columns would form a basis for the column space. Okay, so the column space of A is the span of those two vectors. Right? 1, negative 1, the set with the vectors 1, negative 1, and negative 1, 2. And only two vectors form a basis, right? So the rank of A, the dimension of the column space is 2. And as I said earlier, you know, since since you know these are vectors in R2, and the codomain of the transformation is vectors from R2, this is exactly the same as the range of the transformation. All right, so we got the range as that span there, the set of all linear combinations of these two vectors, and the rank of a, of the standard matrix will be the rank. Right, they're just a number of the transformation. Right, and these are exactly the same two things I got on the previous page. Right the exact same stuff. But by looking at the standard matrix and putting the standard matrix into some echelon form and looking for pivot columns. Right? All right. Now, those first two examples, you know, the, the codomain was was a Euclidean space, right? The codomain was R2 and in the first example the codomain was R3. If you recall from previous videos, when 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 a when a set when a vector space we're dealing with isn't a Euclidean space, we deal with coordinates. All right. So here, again, here I can uh, I got T is a transform a, a linear transformation from R three, right, the typical Euclidean space with three di three dimensional, to P one. Right. This is the set of all polynomials of degree one or less. Right. And here's the rule. Now again, I could say that the range of t, I could very easily write it, the range of t equals, you know, all the, everything, every every polynomial, right, these, these are, the range should consist of polynomials of degree one or less. The range contains every polynomial that looks like this. as long as this a, b, and c are coming from R3, right? As long as those are coming from the, the domain. And this is a perfectly valid way of writing the range. Okay. Um, but the way I'm going to work with it right, is with that standard matrix. Now, you can't write this as a matrix here. Remember, when we're when we're dealing with non-Euclidean spaces, we're going to try to deal with uh, coordinates, right? Change change vectors into their coordinate vectors, the coordinates with respect to the standard basis for that space. So I'm going to call B. So again, let's just say that's, that's the range and stuff. I'm going to do this another way. Say B is the standard basis for P1. I'm not going to work with R3. I'm not going to do it for R3 because R3 is Euclidean. All right? This is only for non-Euclidean spaces that I'm going to do coordinates with respect to the standard basis. So the standard basis for P1, you know, every polynomial of degree 1 or less is some multiple of 1 plus some multiple of x. Right? So, And these are independent. So this was the you know, standard basis for P1. So what I'm going to do is translate, right, take this transformation here, translate it into a coordinate statement, right, with, you know, where I'm working with coordinates relative to the standard bases. Right. So on the left side, well, that's just, you know, my input vector is just from R3. I'll leave it that way. Right, anything Euclidean, I'll just leave. It's the non-Euclidean stuff. You know, this A plus B minus C times X. What are the coordinates of this polynomial? with respect to this basis. So you see I have the, co a, the coefficient of 1 is a. So the first component of my coordinate vector is a. And the coefficient of x is b minus c. So the second co component of my coordinate vector is b minus c. All right, and then again, this is with respect to basis b here. Right? So a little subscript of b. And now I have it so that it's almost like r3 to r2 
All right, you see how it's kind of like written R3 to R2 now? And, and if I have a linear transformation, you know, between R3 and R2, between, you know, Euclidean spaces, even though this isn't, you know, this is representing P1, it's like a Euclidean space vector. Um, I can write this as a matrix multiplied by the input vector. All right, and this is equal to, again, this will this will be a a two by three matrix. Right? And down the first column, the coefficients of a one zero. Second column, coefficients of b zero one. Third column, coefficients of c zero negative one. And then you know, there's your two by three multiplied by the the input vector a b c. All right, and you can again you can double check, multiply these matrices. You should get this two by one back. Right, a two by three times a three by one would be a two by one. Uh, Okay, and then here's my here's my standard matrix. I'll call it A, and it's already in reduced echelon form. It's in that RREF reduced row echelon form already, right? You see how the pivots have zeros below and above them, and they're already leading ones. So look at those pivot columns, right? Pivot column, pivot, and then, you know, I didn't do anything, so this is part of the basis for the column space of A, and so is this. All right, so we're seeing here that the column space of A, the column space of our standard matrix is the span of the vectors, you know, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Right, those those pivot columns form a basis for the column space. Now be careful. Right. This is not right, this is not the range of T like it was before. Because what is the range of T going to compose of? Right, look at the look at the codomain. The outputs should be polynomials. So what you're going to do here, right, now remember these are, instead of these being vectors from R2, right, these are these are actually coordinate vectors with respect to basis B, the, the basis, the standard basis for the codomain. So, so what we're going to do is, if, you know, if the codomain is not Euclidean, right, and I'll write this note off to the side here, um, if the codomain is not Euclidean, right, meaning not R R N, right? You're going to convert convert the basis vectors for the column space into vectors of the codomain. Right. Convert the coordinates, the coordinate vectors in the column space to vectors in the codomain. So again, that's maybe that, I hope that makes sense, right? Because again, I, I can't say that this is the range of t, because the range of t should have polynomials of degree one or less in it. All right. So what I'm thinking of is these are again. The, the, what was the basis b here? Think of these as coordinate vectors with respect to basis b, and so the range of t is you know, not the span, it's not the span of 1, 0, 0, 1, it's the span of the polynomials that the, these, co these are coordinates for. So 1, 0, that's 1 times 1 plus 0 times x, so just 1. And 0, 1 is 0 times 1 plus 1 times x, or just x. So here's the range of t. It is the span of the vectors 1 and x, any linear combination of 1 and x. Well, wait a minute, didn't I say 1 and x was a basis for P1? 
So this is actually all of P1. So the range, the range of this particular transformation is all of the codomain. Everything, every vector, every polynomial in the codomain is an output in this particular transformation. Right. And then the rank, the rank of T is the dimension of the codomain here, or the dimension of the range. And we see that it has a basis with two vectors in it. So again, we have a, a rank of two, right? The, that's just the dimension of P1. Right? P, P1 is the range. Right? Here, this is one of those few instances where we've seen the codomain actually is the range. Right? But just be careful, right? When, when the, like I said here, if the codomain is not Euclidean, you know, you're going you're gonna to get your, you know, your column space for your matrix is going to have Euclidean vectors in it. But those Euclidean vectors are actually vector coordinate vectors with respect to the standard basis for the codomain. So you got to translate those into actual vectors from the base uh, from the codomain from the codomain itself. Right. Okay. Uh, so I got one last example where this is happening. So here, T is from the set of two by two matrices with real entries to the set of polynomials of degree two or less. Now, neither of these are a Euclidean space, uh, but we've seen isomorphisms and whatnot. Like P1 is isomorphic to R2. You saw that, how the coordinate vectors had two components in P1. You know, R2 by two has dimension four, so it's isomorphic to R4. The, you can, the coordinate vectors will have four components and this has got dimension three so the component the, the, the component the, the coordinate vectors will have three components All right. so I'm, again I'm, I, I'm not going to write out what the standard basis is I'm going to assume that you know what they are now because I did write this one up in the last video as well so I'm going to have B be the standard basis for the domain right which is just all those two by two vec uh, all those two by two matrices where you have one and one entry and zero, exactly one entry of one, and all the other entries are zero. So one in the upper left-hand corner, three zeros. One in the upper right-hand corner, three zeros. One in the lower right-hand left-hand corner, three zeros, and then one in the lower right-hand corner, three zeros. And then C, I'm going to have be the standard basis for P2, which is that one x x squared. It's like P1, but you're going up to x squared. Right? Every polynomial degree two or less is a multiple of 1 plus a multiple of x plus a multiple of x squared. All right. All right, so dimension 4, dimension 3. Just keep that in mind. So what I'm going to do here is go straight to the coordinates, right? Just translate. I'm going to translate this into coord uh, it's co you know using coordinate vectors instead. The coordinate vector representation. So here I have t of and then my input I'm going to change to the coordinates with respect to the standard basis. So again, this will have four components. So it'll be A times that first one with the 1, 0, 0, 0, and then plus you know B times the second one, plus C times the third one, plus D times the fourth one in the standard basis in the usual order that I write them. And this is with respect to basis B, the basis for the domain. Will be equal to, and then over here, the coordinates with respect to the basis for P2, right? So you have, you know, B times 1, so B, the first component, 2C times X, 2C for the second component, and then 3D times X squared, so 3D for the third component, and this is with respect to basis C, right, for, for P2, for the, for the codomain. Right. And then I should be able to write this as a, you know, since this is a linear transformation, I should be able to write this as a matrix times my input vector. Now it's, uh, you know, this is dimension, uh, the codomain's dimension three, the domain's dimension four, so the standard matrix is going to be a three by four. All right, it's the dimension of the codomain by the dimension of the domain. Coefficients of A in this output, there's zero, zero, zero. Coefficients of B, there's one, zero, zero. Coefficients of C, zero, two, zero. Coefficients of D, zero, zero, three. And then that matrix multiplied by the input vector A, B, C, and D. And again, don't forget these are coordinate vectors, right? All right, so here's my standard matrix. Again, I'll call it A. All right, I'll call it A. 
Now, can you see the pivots? I mean, it's already in an echelon form. It's already in echelon form because you know all the leading non-zero entries in every row have zeros below it. All right. So pivot column, pivot column, pivot column. So the, this column, and, and I didn't do anything. So these columns are actually a basis. All right, these columns are actually a basis for the column space. All right, so the column space of A is the span of, you know, these three vectors here, one zero, the vector one zero zero. Now, don't forget, three comp now these have three components. These are not part of the codomain, right? One zero zero is not a vector in the codomain. These are actually, we're going to think of these instead as uh, coordinates with respect to the basis for the codomain. So I'm going to put little C's under this so we keep that in mind. And 0, 2, 0, again, coordinates with respect to base, the basis for the codomain. And then uh, 0, 0, 3. And I'm going to put a little C down there so I know that these are coordinates again. Now again, this, this set here, this is not the range of T. All right, the range of T should contain polynomials of degree two or less. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is convert. I convert all these back to polynomials. Convert to elements of P2. Elements of the codomain. So the range of T, you know, it corresponds to the column space of the matrix, right? So I'm going to use, I'm going to use the column space, is the span of, now what is 1, 0, 0 in terms of basis C? That's 1 times 1 plus 0 times x plus 0 times x squared. That's 1. Then 0, 2, 0 is just 0 times 1, 2 times x, 0 times x squared, so 2x. And 0 times 1, 0 times x, 3 times x squared, 3x squared. There's the range of t, all right? It's the span of these three. So any linear combination of these three makes up the range of t. Now look at this, and and again these three pivot columns in an echelon form here. You know, these do form a basis for the range. So the dimension of the range is three, right? There are three vectors in here. So the rank. So the rank of the transformation is three. All right. The rank is th rank is three. There are three vectors in a basis. Additionally, right, the dimension of P two. Right, we know that this is also three. So here is another case where, you know, the dimension of the range is three. The dimension of the codomain is three. So they're the same thing. Right. This is actually just P2. So I have uh, two, uh, I, I know it's back-to-back -back examples. It doesn't always happen, right? You saw that in the first example. The, the range isn't always equal to the codomain. But if the range has the same dimension as the codomain, then the range is the codomain. Right. Um, so there you go. Right. Again, just uh, very easily, you know, again, when they're non-Euclidean spaces, you're changing the coordinates, but that shouldn't be too terrible if you know what the standard bases for these spaces are, and I'm hoping by now, you know, if you've been watching my videos following along, hopefully by now you understand, know the, know the standard bases for certain vector spaces that we've come across you know, quite a bit, the set of matrices, sets of polynomials, and so on. And if they are, you know, and, and if you're, you know, so if you're given a linear transformation, you should be able to represent it as a matrix times some input vector, you know, whether those be coordinates or not. Then put that matrix into an echelon form, whether it be echelon form or reduced echelon form, and uh, you know, look for where, you know, the, remember the pit, the the pivot columns in echelon form correspond to the columns of the original matrix that form a basis for the column space of that matrix. And then that column space, right, corresponds to the range, right? The column space can be translated into the range of the transformation itself, right? All you need to do is convert all the vectors that form a basis for the column space into 
you know, vectors from the actual codomain itself. Right? Just thinking of them as coordinates. Alright, so hope you enjoy working on problems where you're asked to find the range and the rank of a transformation. And thank you for watching.